Well, as you may have noticed, if you've looked at your bulletins, Wes Smith was originally scheduled to be opening up God's Word with us. He's not here this morning due to some unforeseen health-related problems. So I just, I don't know all the details of that, but suffice to say that we can be praying for him this week as he's been navigating some, some of these health challenges. And in his place, I'm happy to open up God's Word with you this morning. So I'm, I'm glad to be here this morning. Uh, I do ask that uh, I learned about this on Friday, so bear with me as I open up God's Word. Uh, sometimes we have to make these last-minute changes. I remember there was one time, uh, I learned about this in show business, by the way, there was one time that uh, I was stage managing a play, and we had a guy kind of, uh, this was actually a musical, and one of our actors actually took a nasal flu shot the day before one of our shows opened up, and he lost his voice completely. And so I remember we had to adjust for that, and I really appreciated the words of, uh, of the director at that time. She ended up saying, we might be surprised by this, but God is not. So I think about that all these years later. And uh, what we ended up actually doing was we had the guy, he was fine, he acted the whole part, but then we had some other guy sing in his place who was, uh, who was backstage. And it was really interesting because this guy's name was Brian. He was really blonde, kind of short kind of guy. And then the other guy was super tall. He had this really deep, booming voice. So we had the actor on stage pretending to sing, and out of his, his, you know, as his chest comes this deep, booming voice from the microphone. So it was a lot of fun. But uh, let's just take a moment before we open up God's Word. Let's come to Him in prayer. Father, as we worship this morning, You are our rock and our Redeemer, our greatest treasure, and our hope, our joy, and our song. As I think about these lyrics that we sang this morning, Lord, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the truth that you are our rock, our stable place, and you're our redeemer. Your grace is bottomless, beyond our comprehension in the way that you have brought us salvation, despite all of our sin. And we thank you for that this morning, Lord. This morning, we want to lift up Wes before your sight you know, Father, what's going on in his situation, the health challenges he is facing. And we just pray for your presence in his life, that you would come alongside him and we would encourage him in your spirit. And that if it be your will, that he would have a speedy recovery from the things that he's struggling with right now. And this prayer goes for all the others in our body, Lord, suffering in our midst, to the people who haven't been able to come out and join us in person because of health challenges or mental health challenges, we want to lift them up to you this morning as well, that you would act in their lives and that you would remind them of the presence of your son Jesus in their lives today, according to your sovereign will. As we open up your word now, I pray that you would bless each one of us with your wisdom in what you would have us take from our text this morning. Be our vision, Lord, and lead us to where we need to grow. Father, we love you and we thank you for all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I very much appreciate Aaron's messages over the last few weeks leading us into the book of 1 Timothy. For those of you who maybe are joining us for the first time or for the first time in a while, we have started a new series in Timothy, in the book of 1 Timothy for the next few weeks, next eight weeks or so. And this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a disciple of his, Timothy, a young man who had been led to Christ and is being discipled. He's currently, at the time of the writing of this letter, in, in the church, the church of Ephesus, I believe. And last week, Aaron kind of walked us through a, a glimpse of Paul's heart. His heart for service, but his, also his heart for the gospel. And one verse in particular, or two verses, I should say, really stick out from last week. And I want to read them again because I think they are so powerful for us to remember. 1 Timothy 1.15, this, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ, Jesus, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who believe in him for eternal life. A powerful message for us to remember today. And if you remember Aaron's example, he stretched his arms out from one end to the other. He said, Paul puts himself on the spectrum and says, this is the best person who I can think of, and this is the worst, and I'm 
on the far end. He models this behavior. And one thing that kind of struck me about his message, I've been thinking it about it all week long, is just Paul here is just really laying his heart bare in this letter. I mean, he could have stopped at the first part of that verse and said, Christ Jesus came to die for sinners. Full stop. And that's true. But he goes on. He goes on and he says, but I'm the worst of them. I am the foremost sinner. He's not just teaching truth here. He's showing his heart. And he's doing it for a reason because 1 Timothy is not just a book about teaching. It's a book about discipleship. Timothy looks up to Paul as to a teacher. And Paul, in return, instead of just teaching, he models this behavior. And I was thinking a little bit about discipleship this week and, and some of my history with substitute teaching. And this is, this is so true. And those of you with parents know what I'm talking about here, that people don't learn a lesson until they see it modeled in front of them. Those of you with children maybe have seen this, that you can tell your kids something, a truth, but until they see it reflected in you, they're not going to learn it nearly as well. I saw this in my years in substitute teaching. I, whenever I would walk into a classroom, I could immediately tell what that teacher modeled for them in life. If I walked into a classroom and it was unruly and it was chaotic, well, I knew that teacher was chaotic. And no amount of threats that they might make with me, you know, we got a substitute teacher, you better behave yourself, it didn't really stick because that classroom was chaos. If I walked into a classroom and, there was, and the teacher was orderly and had expectations of the students and held them accountable, well, I could also hold them accountable. The, the students knew the expectations. They knew how to act because the teacher had modeled it for them. And likewise, for me personally, whenever uh, I had an expectation of students and I didn't model it, the, the students wouldn't listen anyways. I remember there was one time where, you know, the teacher, the, the teacher had a rule, no eating in class. And I, sure enough, I pulled out a snack. I was hungry. I started eating in the middle of class and all the students started calling me out on it. And sure enough, by the end of class, man, there was a few other people pulling out something and trying to ferret it away, even though they knew that that was the rule. If, we're going to, if we are going to teach, we also have to model that kind of behavior. And, and that's what the book of 1 Timothy is about. It's about discipleship. It's about modeling some of the teachings that Timothy has heard. Paul isn't just throwing truth at him, but he's saying, here's how it's practical to your life today. Timothy, you are a leader at this church Live this truth out. And that goes for us today in the church. We aren't just called to hear the word on a Sunday morning and just say, okay, that's great. It's good to know. But we're called to make it practical in our hearts today. So I'd like to just remind you of that before we get started. We are going to find ourselves in 1 Timothy chapter 2 this morning. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. I'm going to have it on the screen. And let's, let's read the word of the Lord together. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all those who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed, a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. And a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is the word of the Lord. And we'll just stop there today. So looking at this passage, when we, when we first approach it, at first glance, it just seems a pretty straightforward teaching on prayer. And it is a teaching on prayer. I'm not going to dispute that. But I think that there's a deeper layer here. Again, like the previous message that we talked about, there's some truth that I think we can absorb into our hearts and a, and a, and a deeper message about discipleship. Discipleship is all about following our master. For us as disciples of Christ. It's about following Christ. And so one of the important things I think we need to, to be thinking about as we approach a passage like this is, who is Jesus? Who is this God that we, are, that we are following, that we are 
disciples of. So wherever you are, you are in your walk with Christ this morning, I don't know if you are a new believer, an old believer, you're a kid, you're a teenager, you're an adult, you're a parent. Take a moment and just look at this passage. What, what do you learn about God from it? What do you know about God from this passage? Pick one thing out, out from there. One thing that I see right off the bat is I see some, some language about what God desires. We see that in verses 3 and 4. And if we are disciples of Christ and we're following after him, what God desires ought to be important to us, shouldn't it? It's where his heart is. Where his heart is, ours should be also. So take a look with me at verses 3 and 4. What does God desire? Here's my first point this morning. God desires that all would be saved. Seems just... Last week, we, last week we saw that Christ died for our sins. We, we read that passage this morning. This week, we, we now see why he did that. He did it because he wants all of us to be saved. And I think back to another scripture, a scripture, first, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. I think about other passages, passages like John 3.16 that say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We see this message all throughout Scripture that God desires all should come to him. And not everyone does. We we, we can see the testament to that in all of Scripture of people who, who walk away from God. But that doesn't change God's heart towards us as people. God desires that all should come to repentance, that all should be saved. That's where his heart is. But the text doesn't just tell us that, that God desires that all should be saved. He also desires that all should come to knowledge of the truth. What is that truth? Verses 5 to 7 help clue us in. In 1 Timothy, it says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Here's my second point this morning. Oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me finish reading that verse. Who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Here's my second point this morning. Christ is the only mediator between us and God. That's another thing we learn about God from this passage. Now that word, mediator, that's an interesting word, isn't it? Do you know what a mediator is? When, like, what, what does a mediator do? I, th- I think one, one example, at least, I think about is in a court situation. If you get taken to court, you have a disagreement with somebody over money. Oftentimes, they bring in this extra person who's a mediator. They call it, you know, they call the process the process of mediation. And that person is there to help sort out exactly, w- you know, what should be done. How can we fix this mistake? You know, how, how, how can both parties kind of walk away feeling happy sometimes? And it doesn't always end up being that way, but the, the whole process is one where there's one person on one side who's hurt, there's another person on another side who, who might or may not be hurt, and then we try and fix the situation. Those of you who are kids, you might go to a teacher. If you have a fight with like your brother or sister or a classmate, you might go to a teacher, or you might go to your parent, and you might say, Mom and Dad, so-and-so hit me. So-and-so said some hurtful things to me. That person is a mediator. They're there to fix the problem. They're going to hear your side of the story. They're going to turn to your sibling or your classmate. They're going to hear their side of the story. And then they're going to try and fix things. Maybe they'll dole out punishment. Maybe they'll ground one person. Maybe they'll just say, hey, you know, you owe that person an apology. They are a mediator. And that's what a mediator does. A mediator makes things right between two people. In this case, in Timothy, it says... Christ is the mediator between us and God. And here's where the metaphor breaks down, though, that that I think is just amazing to think about. 
is that our mediator, Christ, he takes the punishment on himself. He makes things right at the cost of his own blood. And that is crazy. I mean, kids, think about it. If, if you hit your sibling and they, ran, they came to your parents and said something and, you know, mom and, or dad listens to what you have to say and says, okay, you were wrong, but you know what? I'll ground myself instead of grounding you. How crazy would that be? Be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? They took the punishment upon themselves. Okay, I'll, I'll go stand in the corner for 20 minutes. You know, you just go relax, eat a, eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's the same thing in the court situation. It, wouldn't it be crazy to see a lawyer take, take the, the punishment upon himself, say, okay, you owe the money, but I'll pay it for you. What a gift that is. It's where the metaphor breaks down just a little bit. And the best part is, the best part about this scripture this morning is that Christ is still at work today. He is still mediating for us today. And he accomplished that, that the means 2,000 years ago for our salvation on the cross. And yet he's still doing it. He's still working on our behalf today. Romans 8, 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who, at, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That's not past tense. That is today, now. And the thing is, this idea of a mediator, this isn't a new concept in Scripture. We see mediators all throughout the Old Testament. If you look at the Old Testament way of sacrificing of priests, of the high priest, everything you read in, in some of those, uh, those books of the law, the book of Leviticus, we studied this last year or the year before that. All of those are all moments where a mediator intercedes before, between man and God. And you look at from the very beginnings of history, people have always sought to have a relationship with God. And it took different forms for different people. Uh, you look at any culture and you see that there's these practices that people would do to try and connect themselves to God. The idea of a mediator between us and God isn't new. It has always existed. And I mean, you can look at some of the crazy things they used to do. They used to sacrifice animals and like pull out some of the guts and try and like determine, well, what is God trying to say to me by the shape of this, this, these intestines? Ugh. Well, the, that, that stomach is a little off-colored. Maybe that means God isn't happy with me. They, were, they always were trying to seek to, to connect with God. And we see in the Old Testament that finally God speaks to the Hebrew people. He appoints this high priest, and this high priest would intercede between them. There was a law that they had to follow in order to, to connect with God. And that didn't work out too well for them in the end. And so God brings apart, brings this new law, brings, brings a intercessor here. And scripture tells us he is the only mediator. And I, I really love the book of Hebrews because the book of Hebrews helps tell us that all of those priests, all those other mediators, they're all just pointing to the real one. And that's Jesus on the cross. I'd like to read Hebrews 9. It says, For the blood goats and bulls, and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of, of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. The book of Hebrews is all about how the Old Testament is pointing to the new, how it points to one mediator, one redeemer. So I guess where I'm left with here is I'm looking at this passage in 1 Timothy, and we see that Christ is the only mediator, and God desires that all would be saved. And Christ's death is enough for, for all of us to be saved. So where does that lead, lead us in our passage this morning? This is where Paul ends up. 
And last week, Aaron's message to us, if you remember, his final, his main point that he wanted us to remember, I thought was amazing. He said, there is no sin that you have committed that isn't paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. (laughs) My message this morning is similar. It's a parallel for that. If you forget everything else, I want you to remember this, that there is no person unable to be saved by Jesus Christ. Now listen to what I'm saying here. I said there is no person unable to be saved. I'm not saying that all people will be saved by Jesus Christ because that's not the testimony of Scripture. Scripture tells us that it is a free gift that we have the option to receive or not receive if we believe in him. He's knocking at the door and all we have to do is open that door to believe in him, to accept the Holy Spirit and he comes in and dines with us. But if we don't open that door, then we don't accept that gift. Not all people will be saved, but all people are able to be saved. No matter how much, no matter what you think about them. I mean, think of the people you love best in life right now. Think of the people, your family, your friends, people you love. All of them can be saved by Jesus And that's an encouraging thought, isn't it? Now think of the worst person that you can think of. Uh Uh-oh. Now we're kind of getting a little spicy here, aren't we? Are they able to be saved by Jesus? I I think about one of the people I just couldn't stand. His name was Brian, and he was a, a guy I worked with at Calvin when I was in theater, and I don't want to spend too much time complaining about him, but I want to just say that he was probably the most unpleasant person I've ever met. He embarrassed me in front of other people. I I had to work with him, but he he just, there was nothing about him that I liked. He was rude. He was arrogant. He was mean, spirited. He was bitter. He was sarcastic. He thought work was beneath him and didn't want to follow anything that, you know, any instructions I gave him. And if you were nice to the guy, he would just respond with something snide or, or, or something like that. I mean, I'm sure you've all met people like that. You know, your personal Brian. And it still makes my blood boil sometimes when I think about him. But the thing is, as I was reading this passage, he popped into my head. And I kept thinking, did Christ die even for Brian? The answer is yes. Yes. And you see that testament in Scripture. And you know what? As I think about it now, I'm probably a Brian for somebody else. I probably hurt people that I don't even know how I've hurt them. And you know what? Christ died for me, too. So if you're here this morning and you haven't made that commitment, if if you're kind of you've been here maybe for a while and you're still thinking about it, I want to encourage you that 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 gift is for you. There is no person unable to be saved by Jesus Christ. You might be saying to yourself, but I've done all these things. And Aaron kind of talked about this, but I, nothing. Christ died for you. It's a wonderful truth that we have. And we can see that testament in Scripture from all all the Old Testament saints, Abraham, Moses, David, all of them, We see where they started and we see where they ended up as they were following God. And let me tell you, they looked very different, didn't they? You look at Paul's life. Look where he started out and look where he ended up. God transformed his heart and saved him who calls himself the foremost of sinners. It makes me think sometimes, man, Look where I ended up. Look how I started and where I'm at right now. Could God do the same thing for Brian? And what would that look like? It's it's an incredible thought. So what about the rest of us? If we put our faith in Jesus Christ, what what does all of this knowledge do for us today? How ought we to live on a typical Tuesday night, 
Wednesday evening, Friday night out with friends, maybe, you know, some, you know when I'm at work or I'm at home. What is, what, is, what is this truth that there's nobody unable to be saved by Jesus Christ really mean for us today? Well, this is where, I, if you notice, I skipped verses 1 to 2. This is where verses 1 to 2 come back into play. This is where he says, first of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may be, lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. The text says this is good and is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. Here's my final point this morning. What ought we to do about it? How ought we to live? We ought to pray for all people. The best way that we can put our faith into practice is by praying. And do you notice all the alls that we find in this text this morning? I mean, just take a look. How many alls do you count in seven verses? I see first of all, you know, I, I see Thanksgiving should be made for all people. I, I count uh, in verse four, it desires, God desires all people to be saved. And, and there's a few more. In fact, when I counted it up, I counted at least five different alls there. And that's in addition to other words that are kind of inclusive, like men, or, you know, Paul says, I come to the Gentiles, which they talk about all people. It doesn't say the word all, but it implies all. Five different references, specifically in seven verses. This is not one of those passages where we can kind of quantify and kind of qualify, add like a, a little asterisk there that says, ah, but, uh, but what he was really trying to say was, no. When Paul says we ought to pray to intercede and be thankful for all people, he's literally talking about everybody. Those extra words, in fact, and, and help us to clue us into what kind of prayer we ought to have, too. He doesn't say, well, pray for judgment upon the unbelievers. No, he says, intercede for them, to make supplication. These words are fancy words that kind of talk about that we are supposed to be praying for their good. To intercede for someone is kind of like being a mediator. It's kind of to step in to the position uh, and, and in between two people fighting and say, whoa, 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 here's, here's, some, you know, here's somebody I want, I'd like to, you know, I want to lift up this person. Now we know that there's one mediator, but prayer does change things. To supplicate is, is a, just a fancy word to make a petition for somebody else, to ask something for somebody. These are words that are meant to be for the good of others. We're praying for others' good. I mentioned at the beginning that Timothy is about discipleship, following in the footsteps of, of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? Who did Jesus pray for? He ultimately acted on the, the behalf of all people and not just the people that he got along with. So does that mean I, should, I ought to pray for my brothers and sisters here at church who, who I love to spend time with and my family and my friends? Absolutely. We are called to pray for them. Does that mean that I have to pray, though, for the people that I can't stand? That make me look bad, like Brian? Yeah, that's what this passage is kind of saying, isn't it? Do I need to pray for my nosy neighbor who's trying to turn me in for something all the time and is spying on me? It's kind of what this text is implying. Do I need to pray for the homeless guy that I see on the corner? Or the family that I know is on welfare? Yeah, I think that's probably a good thing to do. Do I need to pray for the woman who had an abortion? Do I need to pray for the person who's transitioning in gender? Or the deadbeat dad who's drunk all the time? It's kind of where it gets sticky, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's what this passage is saying. Do I need to pray for that politician who I just can't stand watching on TV? The one who's destroying America and you know, you know the one that you think. This text specifically says, yes, it includes kings. 
in, in, in people that we ought to pray for. And really, the, I think that just clues us into the fact that, man, nobody likes politicians and no one ever has. Even back then, they didn't like politicians. And, and so Paul is saying, pray, pray for kings. Pray for the people in power. And this is challenging. But then it goes even further. And when you think about it, do I need to intercede on behalf of that one person? That one person. And you know the one. The one who hurts you badly. Your ex-spouse, maybe. Your old romantic interest, a bully, a criminal. Your parents. You know, that one person. It's a hard question, isn't it? I feel like as, this is kind of where I struggle as a person to be able to look at that and say, yeah, because part of me says, no, I don't want to pray for that person. I know it's not easy, but as I'm reading this passage and we see what the Spirit is trying to tell us, That's a real question I think we need to ask ourselves. Because God's salvation doesn't depend on what I want, but what he wants. And we already read this morning that he wants all to come to salvation. So I'm not saying that there doesn't have to be a lot of hard work that has to be done, that there's a lot of you know, praying about it, talking with God about it. But maybe he is leading you to pray for that one person too for their good. Because like I said, if God could transform Paul, Paul says this himself, how much more can he transform all of us? I think back to the cross and what Jesus did for us. And he prayed for us. He said, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you to pick one person that you, that you love, that maybe you want to see come to Christ or come to, to increase in the Spirit, to grow in the Spirit. And I want you to pray for them. But I also want you to pick one other person, one person you can't stand, and pray for them as well. Pray for their good. Pray that they would come to Christ or that God would convict them in their heart. Pray for their benefit. And you can start small. It doesn't have to be that one person I'm talking about. That, that, that one person you might need to, to, to talk a lot with God about before you get to that point. I'm not asking you to do that. Just pick one person that you don't like in your life or that you struggle with relating to and pray for them. Because God calls us to pray for all people. And if we have his heart, if we're following after him, then we're going to look just like him. That's the word of the Lord in 1 Timothy this morning. So let's, let's just take a moment. Let's, let's thank God for what Christ has done for us and for this incredible truth. Father God, I thank you for your word this morning that we've read in Scripture, that you are the mediator. That Jesus died so that we could have a relationship with you. And Father, we know that in, this, in, this rela- in our relationship before we were saved, there was nothing that you did. It, the harm was only on our side. And yet Christ paid for that. He interceded on our behalf, and he is interceding for us today. Father, I pray that as we think about discipleship and as we grow in being your disciple, that you would tune our hearts, tune our hearts to, to, to what you desire beyond what we think is right and what we want. Father, help us to, to desire all people being saved and increase and help, help encourage us to pray for everyone, all the people we meet, the politicians, our friends, our family, and even the ones we don't like, our enemies. We ask these things in the name of Jesus.